All right, good morning, everyone. So uh, this talk is on lipid recovery 101. And in this talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, what are lipids, how much total vegetable oil is produced worldwide, what are some of the conventional processes to recover fats and oils, cost of oil recovery, what are some of the new processes to recover oil, and how can we recover uh, lipids from cabbie crops, and the role CABI can play in meeting the demands for oils and biofuels production. All right, uh, so lipids are uh, generally hydrophobic organic compounds that can be broadly classified as fats, waxes, phospholipids, and steroids. Fats are primarily triacylglycerols. What that means is a glycerol molecule attached to three fatty acids. And uh, uh, you can have uh, saturated fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, or polyunsaturated fatty acids. And um, um, if there's only one acid attached to a glycerol molecule, it's called monoglyceride. If there are two, diglyceride. And if there are three, then it's a triglyceride. Waxes are simple lipids that consist of a large fatty acid esterified to a large um, alcohol. Then phospholipids is a glycerol molecule attached to two fatty acids and a phosphate group. And steroids are made up of these four fused hydrocarbon rings that are important in structural and endocrine functions. So for this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on fats and oils. All right. Uh, so saturated fats have single bonds and they are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats have have double bonds and they are um, liquid at room temperature. Uh, fats uh, typically comes from animal sources. Oils will come from plant sources. If you look at the lipid composition of a crude oil and refined oil, this is what we see. In this case, this is for corn oil, that 98% of the material is triacylglycerols, but you also have fatty acids, phospholipids, and some unspawnifiables in it. And crude oil has a very short shelf life, has some off flavors. So we take it through a refining process. And that process is called RBD process, refining, bleaching, and deodorization. And when you do that, you see that you have 99% or more triacylglycerols and a little bit of unspawnifiables present in the refined oil. All right, if we look at overall edible oil production worldwide, we produce close to about 210 million metric tons of oil every year. And the biggest share comes from the palm oil. Um, and there are two kinds of palm oil, one that comes from the fruit, another one that comes from the kernel, palm kernel. Followed by palm is uh, soybean oil, rapeseed, sunflower, and then other types of oils. Here, is the corn oil production, um, but that is only for US. Everything else is, is worldwide uh, edible oil production. Now, there are two major processes that are used to recover oil from oil seeds. The first one is the mechanical extraction of oil. In this, usually the flaked, um, uh, cracked, flaked, and conditioned oil seeds are fed into a barrel and then the screw will, will squeeze these oil seeds and um, the oil comes out through these slats. So here in the bottom picture, you can see soybean oil coming out through the slats. And here on the right is a commercial facility um, set up for mechanical extraction of soybean oil. The other process that's used, uh, conventional process that's used to recover oil is the extraction process, solvent extraction process. And there are many different solvents that can be used. Usually it's hexane. Here is a deep bed extractor uh, called Rotacell, where uh, flaked uh, oil seeds are added to these cells, the wedge-shaped cells. The solvent goes in on the other end and the solvent picks out the oil, the micella, micella drops at the bottom. It goes through this like a merry-go-round. It keeps on rotating. The final oil comes out, drops down here at the bottom, gets collected in the tank. Another type of a very common extractor, which is called the shallow extractor, 
um, is the crown extractor that is very commonly used. Um, and these are very extensive, you know, uh, uh, um, very extensive pieces of equipment used for uh, solvent extraction of, uh, of oil seeds. Now, if you look at the cost uh, of production of edible oils, it can vary depending upon the unit fixed cost, can vary anywhere from 0 0.08 dollars per kg of the oil seed to about 0 0.033 dollars per kg. The net cost of production um, uh, in dollars per kilogram of oil can vary anywhere from 3.2 to about 3.6 dollars per kg, depending upon mechanical extraction or solvent extraction um, of that um, of that crude oil. Now, something. So this is all conventional. This is everything you know how how edible oils are produced, how they are recovered, what is the cost of recovering these oils. Now, something very interesting happened in 2004. Uh, before I get into that, let me just briefly talk about the dry grind ethanol process. So in a dry grind ethanol process, corn is, uh, whole corn is ground, and then it goes into a conventional dry grind ethanol facility where um, it, it, it gets liquefied, simultaneously carified and fermented, and then and distilled to produce ethanol. And at the back end, we get what is called distillate dried grains with solubles, which is a co-product that is used mostly for ruminant animal diets. So fermentation, scarification fermentation is a very lengthy process, can vary anywhere from 40 to upwards of 70 hours. And in one of the dry grind ethanol plant, there was a technical issue and they had to shut down the plant. They had to shut down the entire plant. And what happened is, uh, typically, he, here's a fermentation tank sitting in day one. On day six, when they went back and tried to restart the plant, they noticed a thick layer of oil sitting here on the top of the fermentation tank. So what they did is they tapped this tank and they, they drained out that oil. But this gave this company an idea, hey, we can recover this corn oil at the back end of a dry ground ethanol plant. And there's not much that is required to recover this oil. You can just put a centrifuge and centri phase separate this oil from the, the thin stillage. So what started happening is after 2004, this industry started to recover what's called distiller corn oil at the back end. And you can get about 0.7 pounds of distiller corn oil from every bushel of corn. Now this oil had very high levels of free fatty acids. So it was primarily going for poultry feed or for biodiesel production. It couldn't be used for human food consumption just because the level of free fatty acids is, was as high as 20 to 22%. Normally, if you look at the oil in, in coming from corn kernel, it will have about you know, maximum 2% free fatty acids, but, uh, but Corn has endogenous lipases that break this, uh, you know, the triacylglycerols into fatty acids. Yeast also produces these lipases. So during fermentation, you end to break down these triacylglycerols and create a lot more fatty acids. So this oil started going for poultry industry. And because it carried a lot of these, um, uh, you know, uh, coloring compounds, oxygenated carotenoids, which give ye uh, yellow color to the egg yolk or to the golden color to the meat, it became very uh, something that poultry industry started using quite a bit and uh, rest of it started going for the biodiesel industry. Mostly it was exported to Europe for biodiesel production. And if you look at how much distiller corn oil was produced, so in 2005, there was very small amount. And today we are producing close to about 1.8 million metric tons of distiller corn oils in the United States. So this was very interesting because this was aqueous extraction of oil in a dry ground ethanol plant. And this got a lot of people started doing research in this area. A lot of papers were published during this time, even though aqueous extraction, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there were papers about aqueous extraction prior to that, but a lot of papers were published. Here's a study that was done by USDA Eastern Regional Research Center by Dr. Robert Moreau. And he showed that you can recover about 90% 
of the free oil that is present in the corn germ, and you just have to use a centrifuge to remove this oil. So uh, this is a centrifuge that can be used for uh, separation of this oil, and the performance of the centrifuge depends upon the Stokes law, which gives you the settling velocity. In this case, it will be the oil droplets, and it's dependent upon the diameter of the, of the droplet, so non-shear retention time can allow coalescence of this oil. The droplet gets bigger, improves the efficiency of recovery of this oil. Or the angular ac acceleration, uh, which depends upon uh, you know, the, the RPMs or the G that can be generated in the centrifuges. In case of a distack uh, three-phase centrifuge, you can go as, as high as 8,000 Gs. Or if you use a tricanter centrifuge, uh, you can go up to 3,500 Gs. Uh, also, you can change the continuous phase uh, viscosity by doing like a heat treatment to the feed going into the centrifuges. So here is how the chemistry works. You have oil suspended in that, in that phase, and then it starts to coalesce either via creaming or by flocculation or coagulation by adding surfactants to it. So the oil droplets will start to coalesce, uh, they get bigger, and then there's a phase separation, and then you put a centrifuge to recover the soil. So here you can see use of these surfactants to increase the droplet size. Here on the right panel on the top, you can see oil droplets in thin stillage, and here are the oil droplets when you add these surfactants to it. And here is the work that was done. In the first case, no surfactant was added. And in these two, two different surfactants. And you can see this uh, lipid layer on the top of the thin stillage. Another way of improving the performance of this oil is to add some of these enzymes. Usually, these uh, lipids are protected by a protein layer like oleosin or kelosin. Um, and you can add these proteases to disrupt these uh, these protein layers, you can add even some of these cellulases to break down some of the cell wall structure and further improve the recovery of the soil. So here are all these different enzymes that have been tried with these different uh, botanical sources for, for lipids. Here is a, a, a quick video on a tricanter centrifuge, how it's used to separate the oil, the water, and the semi-solids. Float fake tricanter is a special type of decanter centrifuge. It is capable of continuously separating two liquids and one solid from each other. The medium to be separated enters the tricanter via the infeed pipe. In our example, the medium consists of water, oil, and solid. So here you can see the oil coming out, the liquid Perfect goes out that port, and, and the semi-solid drops down from this port. Separation. If the impeller diameter is adjusted too small, this may cause water to remain in the light oily separation phase. If the impeller diameter is set too large, oil may be present in the heavier water phase. Optimal adjustment of the float vague impeller can achieve sharp separation results for both the light and heavy phases. All right, I'm gonna stop that. So float wig tricanter is what is being used. There are other centrifuges too, but these are the type of tricanter centrifuges that are being used at the back end of a dry granothal plant to recover this oil, uh, distiller corn oil. So CABI is all about producing oil in vegetative tissues of these, these biomass, you know, sugarcane, sorghum, and miscanthus. And we would like to use the same kind of aqueous extraction of this oil from these scabby crops. And the way it, it, we envision doing that 
is just like how sugarcane is processed in a sugarcane refinery. It arrives at the facility and then it goes through what's called a mill tandem. These are very big rollers that crush that oil, uh, the, the sugar cane and get the juice out. And if we have lipid cane going through that, there's water coming at the other end that you get all that oil to come out in the juice. And then uh, here you can see these big rollers that crush that. And then you can put a tricanter centrifuge right here and recover this oil. Um, and the potential of the total oil being produced is, is enormous. Uh, so if, if in a crop like sugarcane, you can uh, get about 20% total oil in, in that sugarcane, you can improve the photosynthesis of oil. That means there's more biomass. And if you improve the cold tolerance of this sugarcane, you can grow this sugarcane in this area. This was actually a map done by DOE where sugarcane currently grows marginal land where this engineered sugarcane can grow. And if you grow the sugarcane over here, this is an area that is not currently under row cultivation. You can produce close to about 2 point, or sorry, 25 billion gallons of biodiesel. So the potential of producing very large amounts of oil is there with Gabby crops. And this, this is just with sugarcane. So if you look at what the total amount of oil that can be produced in million metric tons, you can produce almost 57 million metric tons of oil coming from, from, from lipid cane. Now, when we actually did this work, we ran into two issues. When this work was done last year at IBRL, what we found is that, that oil, there was about 2% oil in the lipid cane that we were processing, but that oil did not come out into the juice. There was some oil that came out in the juice and we could use a centrifuge to recover that lipid, but most of it was still in the bagasse. And we had to recover that oil after the pretreatment and the hydrolysis and put another centrifuge to get some of that lipid out. So that was the one issue that we ran into that when we were doing this processing of lipid gain is that the oil, uh, some of that oil was recovered from the bagasse fraction or most of the oil was recovered from the bagasse fraction. And secondly, the amount of free fatty acids was very high in this oil, okay? It has very high amounts of phospholipids um, uh, or polar lipids and free fatty acids compared to the crude vegetable oils, almost twice, more than twice the amount of uh, free fatty acids that you see in crude vegetable lipids. So that leads us to another area how we can separate these free fatty acids and polar lipids so that they are not interfering with the biodiesel production process. And for that, we did several of these studies where we tried to use these different solvents, acetone, methanol, and then thermal or enzymatic glycerolysis to convert these free fatty acids into tag, mags, and dags. So this is an active area of research. And Krishna, right after my talk, is gonna talk about how we are separating these free fatty acids uh, and we are providing these fat, free fatty acids to, to Dave Flaherty's group to, uh, to catalytically upgrade them into uh, high value products. Also to take these free fatty acids and take them through an enzymatic glycerolysis process and convert them into, into these forms so that they can be then converted into biodiesel production. Okay, there's also some unspawnifiables that are present in lipid gain. So here on the top are some unspawnifiables uh, that were recovered from conventional store, but here from the lipid gain, the amount of unspawnifiables is almost twice uh, that you would get from, um, from the crude oil, from the corn crude oil. And this itself is about $2.5 billion in industry where they're adding these unspawnifiables, these phytosterols, um, ferrolate phytosterol esters, into different food products, and these unspawnifiables have been shown to reduce serum cholesterol. So that itself is another big market. And Krishna is, is working on uh, putting this biorefinery concept of converting these um, uh, cabby crops and producing all kinds of different products from, from these crops. All right. Another thing that's going on is that not only are we producing oil in cabbie crops, we also have the residue that can be converted into sugars 
and those sugars can then be further converted into oil, microbially converted into oil. And here's a study that was done from Brazil that showed the amount of biodiesel that can be produced from sugars, from microbially produced lipids, is much more than what you can get from soy diesel. And they also showed that the cost of producing that is much less. It's only 0.76 dollars per liter compared to the soy diesel cost of 0.81 uh, dollars per liter. But this again is, is if you take all the sugars and microbially convert those sugars into, into, into lipids. But what we are showing from cabbie crops is that if we convert that directly in the crop itself, like we are doing in lipid gain, the potential is even higher than that. You get 6,700 liters per hectare of, of, of biodiesel that can be produced. And the cost is very competitive, even lower than microbially produced biodiesel. It's only 0.59 dollars per liter. Now, why is that important? Is because of this industry, this emerging industry in the United States, where they're starting to produce renewable diesel. There's already 1.5 billion gallons of renewable diesel capacity, existing diesel capacity, but there's about 1.8 billion gallons of capacity that is under construction. And these are all old petroleum refineries that are being retooled to produce renewable diesel. And the feedstock for this is vegetable oils, fat, you know, grease, yellow grease. Uh, and so lipids are these sources. And the availability of these sources is just not there. Uh, there's another 3.5 billion gallon of capacity that has been announced for this renewable diesel. And this is information from Energy Information Administration that show right there on the website that the biggest risk to the sustainable aviation uh, fuels is lack of availability for fats, oils, and grease feedstocks. They're just not available. And there's this huge capacity that has been announced or already under construction trying to use these uh, fats, oils, and, 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 and yellow grease. The, what's happening is that the price of vegetable oil is going up because of those reasons. Uh, yesterday itself, Marathon did an, uh, an partnership with ADM to build a, a soybean facility in order to provide the feedstock for their renewable diesel. And it's just not going to come from the, the, the vegetable crops right now. Here is historical and projected future production of fats, oils, and grease. And you can see these are pretty much straight lines for canola, yellow grease, other grease, corn, beans, and tallow. Whereas the consumption on the other, high, on the other hand is going up for edible products, for renewable diesel. So availability of these vegetable feedstocks you know, that can provide vegetable oil is just not there. And that's where CABI plays a very important role. So if you look at the total capacity that announced the construction, you need about 17.54 million metric tons of oil. And you just cannot get it from the traditional uh, vegetable uh, uh, crops. And lipid cane is where it can come in or cabbie crops can come in and, and provide that extra capacity. 